Good morning, Good News Baptist Church. I'm excited to be back with you, with you. Uh, this is Dean calling from the bunker. <laughs> I'm held up in the house. Uh, I know some people are, you know, going out and doing things and going all over the province just as a family. We've kind of decided that we're just going to narrow uh, our interactions with folks. So I'm glad that I could interact with you in this way, and I'm thankful uh, for you guys being a little bit flexible. I know it's a little weird uh, seeing that I'm only probably like, what, an hour and a half away. Uh, but uh, this is the times that we're living in. This is <laughs> history that's being made. And talking about history, that is what we're talking about this morning. I'm excited to be back talking about the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it's been a bit, so I'm excited to hop into this third lesson uh, but as we do that, I just want to give a little bit of a refresher on this idea of creeds because I know uh, it's not something that comes naturally for a lot of us. Uh, we think about creeds and it, our minds kind of go to this like high view of church, this liturgical kind of concept of, um, you know, confessions and creeds and catechisms. And that's not really something that uh, a lot of mainstream or even the IFB movement, Independent Fundamental Baptists, they, they don't really do a whole lot of that, um, mostly because, you know, independent. So uh, <laughs> you don't want to be signing off on these huge uh, statements of faith uh, because you're very specific. So uh, a lot of us come to this kind of with fresh eyes and not really knowing, uh, you know, which, which creed I should be paying attention to, um, you know, who wrote it, all those kinds of things. It's all kind of new territory for a lot of us. Uh, so I'm excited to be talking about it with you this morning and to give you just a couple reminders as we get started this morning. Uh, the word creed comes from the Latin credo, meaning I believe. Uh, so when we say that we hold to this creed, we are saying that I personally, I personally believe, I affirm this statement of faith. Now, uh, they are usually smaller documents, uh, usually summaries of what someone believes, and sometimes even very practical of confronting some certain heresy or just saying, this is how I'm going to live my life. Uh, this creed is very much both of those things. So it's saying that I believe this. Uh, credo is how we view baptism. We, uh, as Baptists, we follow credo baptism, meaning that you have to be a believer to be baptized, unlike pedo baptism, for example, which is uh, children, uh, baptizing children. So they don't necessarily have to believe. They're just part of the covenant people of God because of uh, the family that they were born into, and so they baptize them there. We would say, no, you need to be baptized if you believe. And so creed comes from that same idea. A creed is a public declaration or confession of biblical truth. So while it is a personal thing, you're saying, I personally believe this, you're saying it in a public way. Very much like baptism, to keep with that same line of thinking. Uh, baptism is a personal thing, saying that I'm going to follow Jesus because I believe in Jesus. But you don't do that, you know, in your tub. Uh, you do that in the, the congregation. You do that in the in amongst the people of God in the church. So uh, this is that same kind of a thing, not necessarily just in the church, but in a public way. You're saying, I declare that I believe this. Uh, a creed uh, often came directly from a council, rather from specific churches or denominations. So these are broader statements, usually. Uh, broader statements that Anyone could kind of hop on board if you believe the gospel and believed in this certain aspect of what's being said in the creed. It was uh, an ecumenical document, uh, something that brought a whole bunch of different denominations, people from different backgrounds together to say that we affirm this statement. And usually it was very basic. Uh, so while, you know, churches obviously have their own doctrinal statements and for, I mean, uh, 1,500 years that's been going on, or denominations have their own uh, statements of faith. Creeds are kind of like that that uh, entry point of saying, this is what I believe, like a lot of you. So, for example, uh, most uh, evangelicals would be able to say, 
that I affirm the Apostles' Creed. Now, there are some people who don't like certain words, so they won't necessarily say that they affirm it right off the bat. They'll have some nuances. But generally, if you believe in Jesus, you can say that I believe in the Apostles' Creed. And uh, I'm excited. We're coming up to it, uh, Jesus descending into hell. That'll be a, a fun lesson. But today, we're, we're going to be talking about something else. All right, so creeds are often short theological statements composed to combat some type of teaching. So an example would be the Nicene Creed. Uh, he had Arius going around saying that Jesus was not God, that he was not fully God, that he uh, was uh, God-like. Sound, sound familiar? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are basically, um, they're just following after Arius. Um, but other than St. Nicholas at the Council of Nicaea punching him in the face, they also came out with this document uh, called the Nicene Creed that combated that. So uh, this huge group of different pastors, different theologians, representatives of different churches coming together and saying that we are all on the same page about this. So creeds are often short uh, theological statements. And Justin Holcomb, he wrote this, the creeds are the boundaries of the faith that separate orthodoxy from heresy. While the confessions color in the picture, tying theology to everyday life in all sorts of ways. So uh, what he's saying here is that the creeds are like the fringes. <laughs> uh, it, it is like the, the, that outside line. If you're on the outside of this creed, then you're not a Christian. Uh, now, obviously, you know, people, people nuance things when they talk about theology and so there might, you know, you can't just say 100 percent, but in in general, uh, in a general way, you're not a Christian if you don't affirm uh, one of these basic creeds. So it's supposed to kind of give us that boundary of where does that line cross from being, you know, on this side, you have Christian and on this side, you have apostasy uh, or heresy. Uh, well, that's what the creeds are meant for. They're supposed to be like that, that mountain range holding all that weather pattern in. So what do you believe about Jesus? That's what we're talking about today. A good topic, talking about Jesus Christ. What do you believe about Jesus? Now, today is a little weird because I'm not with you. Uh, usually I would ask and I would wait for an answer. Uh, but I'm going to ask I know it's kind of weird. I'm just thinking about it right now. I'm going to ask if someone could pause the video just for a minute here, and then we'll move on. But I would like for you guys to talk about it yourself. If you were to put those boundaries of what it means to be a Christian and an, or a non-Christian in what you believe about Jesus, so like the, the most essential elements of what you need to believe about Jesus to understand Jesus, what would that be? Talk amongst yourselves. Is it unpaused? I hope it's unpaused because I'm about to move on here. Um, so I'm pretty sure that all of those answers were all really good. Um, you know, it's it's hard. My, my point in asking you these things is not to try to trick you, um, but it's hard to just summarize the gospel uh, and summarize like these main tenets of our faith in like short, concise, and even memorable um, ways. So um, how do you boil it all down is really like the, the question and still maintain the integrity of that doctrine or subject that you're talking about. So how did the apostles do that? Or at least some would say the apostles Others would say maybe the second generation of the early church, depending on how old do you think this document is. Either way, it comes really early on in the faith, so we can take it pretty authoritatively to be um, definitely what the early church believed. So how did they summarize it? Well, they summarized it this way. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, if you got it, this is what uh, they believed about Jesus, and I think sets a beautiful boundary about what you need to believe in order to call yourself a Christian. So here we have three different um, elements of this concept of Jesus. So the first uh, is that we need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, second, his only son, so that he is the son of God. And third, that he is our Lord. Those are the three main concepts that you must understand to call yourself a Christian. So let's dive into these each uh, on its own. So that's uh, also uh, G.I. Packer, um, which this book, uh, if you're looking for books on this, uh, Growing in Christ, it has a, an awesome section in the beginning about the Apostles' Creed. And on uh, page 39, he says this, this claim is central. So talking about this specific claim and in Jesus Christ, uh, God's only son, uh, our Lord. Uh, this claim is central to the layout of the creed. For the long section on Jesus Christ stands between the two shorter sections on the Father and the Spirit. And it is central to the faith of the creed. For we could not know about the Trinity or salvation, or resurrection, and life everlasting apart from Jesus Christ. Uh, I never saw it this way, to be honest, until I was reading uh, and studying for this, uh, but it's true. Uh, we have it, you know, a little short statement on the Father, and in, you know, this the last section, really, uh, we're going to have a short statement on the Holy Spirit, uh, but in between, it is all about Jesus because he is our faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christians. Christ is the figure of our faith. And yes, we believe in a triune God, but he is the central point of our faith. Uh, and so he is central to the layout here of the creed. And so what we're going to have as we move through the creed is we have the summary, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the theological summary of these three main aspects of what it means to believe in Jesus. And then we're going to have the, the story, the explanation of how all of this came about. Uh, and I'm excited to get into that. But for this morning, we're just looking here at the summary. So what does it mean that to say that we believe in Jesus Christ? Well, uh, you probably know this. But Jesus was the Greek translation of the name Joshua, Yeshua, uh, meaning God will save his people. That's what the angel told Mary, right? Uh, we know that. Uh, but here is the, the biggest part that we need to understand. Uh, <laughs> I've heard so many jokes from pastors saying this, uh, but Christ was not Jesus' last name. Um, a lot of people just say Jesus Christ, and they don't understand what they're doing. Uh, they don't understand the, the theological uh, just weight of this term that is the Christ. Uh, Christ means especially anointed by God. It was not unique to Jesus and in the Gospels and then flowing out into the epistles, um, but it was something that we see pretty clearly in the Old Testament. Uh, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But it means especially anointed by God, that God has his hands on this person and has uh, equipped them to do some specific work. So this speaks to Jesus's role as the deliverer promised in Genesis 3, verse 15. So in Genesis 3, we have uh, the cursing of, of Adam and Eve and the snake. And in verse 15, we have the, the beautiful promise that there will be someone who will come from Eve who will be the snake crusher, who will crush the head of the snake and his heel will be bruised. So ever since then, ever since the Proto-Evangelium is what we call it, the, the first gospel, 
the first good news, the first hint that there was going to be something to come and kind of bring reconciliation to this whole story. Um, ever since then, we have this idea of God anointing this this snake crusher, this this individual who would come and redeem mankind. And, and so there's kind of this this arc that we have of this title. We don't see this title especially used to refer to the one who would be coming to fulfill that role uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, but we see very clearly as soon as we get into the New Testament that that is what they are calling this individual and they are looking for him. Now, why? Well, it's probably in relationship to them being downtrodden by Rome and always looking for a deliverer, just like they did in Judges. Um, but this speaks to Jesus' role as the deliverer, as the promised one, as the hero who is going to come and redeem the people of Israel, uh, specifically in that time frame. And then, of course, us uh, after he uh, ascends into heaven. So. The term was uh, the term Christ also points to Jesus' role as anointed prophet, priest, and king, and that is the the three offices that are mostly used when you're talking about this word for anoint, um, uh, this this idea of being the Christ, uh, the anointed one of God. It refers to prophets and to priests and kings. So God would lay his favor, his his hand, if you will on these individuals and give them a specific task that they're supposed to go out and accomplish for his glory. Uh, so that's what Jesus does. He is our prophet. He is the one telling us the truth. He is the word declaring uh, the, the word of God to us. Uh, he is the priest who makes uh, the sacrifice for us, who enters into that uh, holy of holies and makes propitiation through his blood. He is the king who rules. And we'll talk about more about that in the sermon today. Uh, but he fulfills those three roles. And this points to the fact that Jesus is the central figure of the Bible and thus history. Because right here, when we see that Jesus is the Christ, this is like that, that meeting point between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So everything from Genesis 3, verse 15 on is looking toward this figure who would come, the anointed one of God, to come and redeem mankind, and he is that one. And so all of the Bible is focused on Jesus, and all of history is focused on that moment when he can make atonement for our sins to fulfill that first gospel, that proto-evangelium of Genesis 3, verse 15. So he is that Christ. He is the Messiah. So when we confess Jesus as Christ, we are confessing his role as our Savior. So uh, when we say that, Jesus Christ, we are saying Jesus is our Savior. So here, that's huge because we're bringing in that idea right off the bat that he is the only one who is capable of being able to be that redeemer for us that we desperately need, like I shared with you last time. And we we're talking about that kinsman uh, redeemer idea from, from Ruth onward. That's Jesus. And so when we talk about the Apostles' Creed, that's something that needs to be part of those that, that summary about who Jesus is. So Charles Spurgeon, he says it this way. If he is not to us the Christ, the Lord's anointed, and the Son of the living God, we know not Jesus aright. It's something very basic that we need to understand. So, uh, not only is he the Messiah, but he is his only son. He is the Father's only son. Jesus is the only begotten son of the Father. That might sound super basic for you, but some people really get into trouble with this idea of Jesus being the Son of God. So let me say, just briefly, I'll try to be brief, uh, what this does not mean. All right, What this does not mean is that Jesus was a created being. Uh, John 1, verses 1 through 4, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So, uh, we have... God being there and Jesus also being there at the same time. Uh, I think I preached John 1 for you way back in the day, so you probably don't remember. But the idea 
uh, in the beginning was the word. That word was, uh, the tense of it is to say that it was existing already. It didn't come into existence in that moment. It was continuing to exist. So the Father and the Word, Jesus, we know that from later on, I think in verse 14, it says that Jesus was that Word. Uh, these two uh, persons are, are existing at the same time, and then it is through the Word that everything was made, and nothing was made without him. So we have categories that are set up right there in the text of John 1 that clearly say that Jesus made all things. You cannot make yourself, and so Jesus stands in this transcendent category of with the Father uh, as being something that was not made, and then this other category that would include us, that would include the planets, that would include everything else, that, that fits into that category of being created. So we have non-created and created very clearly there. So it does not mean that Jesus was in some way born, uh, that the second person of the Trinity did not come into existence there in the nativity scene. Uh, you know, in that manger, Jesus didn't just all of a sudden appear, and that was the first time that the Son of God has ever existed. That's not what uh, is orthodox with Christianity, and that's not what Scripture says. Uh, it does not mean that Jesus is lesser than the Father. John 5, verse 23, uh, says very clearly uh, that um, Jesus is going to get glory, just like the Father is going to get glory. Uh, there is an equivalence that is very, very clearly held by Jesus between him and the Father. And we know uh, even a few months ago, not a few months ago, it's been a long time, COVID has like made it ev everything so relative and it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, Charlie was born yesterday. It's, no, that was like, he's going to be one here pretty quick. <laughs> so um, so I think it was like a year and a half ago, maybe, maybe even longer than that. Uh, I preached on Revelation chapter 5 with you guys. Uh, and we saw very clearly there that the the lamb that was slain is going to get glory for all of eternity. Uh, glory to the one who sits upon the throne and to the lamb that was slain, this equivalence. We see that clearly throughout all of Scripture. So there is no level of um, deity. There's not like it's the Father is number one God, and then there's like these two other persons that are lesser than him. No, they're on equal, they are co-equal with one another. Uh, Jesus, being God's only Son, then speaks to this. Uh, it speaks to his nature. All the attributes of the Father belong to the Son. Uh, I've talked about that a whole bunch. Uh, I, I have learned as I've gotten older that I am very much like my parents in some very good ways and also some ways that I'm working on. Uh, I think all of us are like that. We take on the attributes of our parents. We become like them. Uh, in that way, when we talk about Jesus being the Son, all the attributes of the Father, and we see this in other places like Colossians chapter 1, uh, of being made in the image of God, uh, all the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus Christ. So his nature, all the attributes of the Father belong to the Son and his authority. He is the heir of all things. Uh, so when the Son speaks with authority, it is the same authority that the Father has. Uh, it is not like, oh, it's just the Son, we don't need to pay attention to that. It's not like that, it's saying, no, Jesus is the Son of God. When he says something, it is authoritative, it is coming from God himself. Uh, his relationship. Now, we talked about this a little bit uh, in our last study when we talked about the Father being uh, that it's God the Father, maker of all things. Uh, we talked about this relationship, and it's very important to us to understand that we, we can't be, uh, how to say this, we can't be as concrete on some things that we would like to be. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we cannot follow every logical conclusion based on what we experience between fathers and sons. Uh, to do so would then lead to some places uh, that, you know, Arius got into and other heretics mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, so we can only deal with the relationship as it is presented to us in the scriptures. 
and there is a special relationship between the father and the son. So I'll just I'll just end it there. And uh, if you have questions, you can text me. All right. So uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, who was a fourth century um, theologian and pastor, uh, he wrote this uh, or he said this. This was from a sermon. The uh, father designates neither the substance nor the activity, but the relationship, the manner of being which holds good between the father and the son. So when we talk about this relationship, that's what it is. It's father and son. And we need to be very careful that we don't start getting away uh, into uh, where we understand father and son and go into like biological terms and things like that. It's talking about the relationship that they have. A father to a son. Uh, I like the way Michael Reeves put this in um, High King of Heaven. Uh, Without the eternal son, you don't get that gospel. Uh, No eternal son, no sonship. No eternal son, no eternal father. If God is not father, he couldn't give us the right to be his children. So if you don't have this concept in your, you know, statement about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ, If you don't have the son in there, that he is the son of God, not just that he's the second person of the Trinity, but that he is the son of God, then you can't call God the father father because he's not a father. Um, If he doesn't have a son, he ain't a daddy, right? Uh, So uh, we need to be very careful about adding certain theological terms when we're trying to summarize the gospel and this, the, the idea of God being or or Jesus being the son of God, is crucial. So, if Jesus is the eternal son of God, will he always be subordinate to the Father? Now, um, I don't want to camp on this too long, uh, because uh, honestly, I don't don't know exactly how long this has been going. I'm getting kind of worried about it. I have my devices here that I'm working on here, and I realize I don't have my watch on. uh, So trying to be just kind of ballpark where we're going to end i'm sure you guys will be flexible with me uh so uh let's let's talk about this though because this is important this is something that's being debated about right now you might look at it and be like i don't even understand what you're trying to say is like an argument i don't what does this even mean well there is this issue of the eternal subordination of the son i think i've referenced it a couple times when i've been there with you but it is something that is being discussed uh, among theologians and the way things work Uh, first theologians kind of you know they sit in their ivory towers and just you know uh, think about these things for hours on end and somebody pays them to do it Uh, Mm -hmm. but they they think about all these things and the next thing you know it's in the seminaries and that's where uh, the pastors are being trained or or the Bible colleges uh, and the pastors then bring it into the church and it comes down to you guys. Right. Uh, so even when just, you know, you might think about it and be like, oh, it's just theologians, you know, just talking th- uh, these things out. It definitely has an impact in the, the local church. So the issue of eternal subordination of the son, what is it? Well, the eternal subordination of the son uh, holds that the son of God has always been and will always be subjecting himself to the Father's will. What that means is, you know, to take that relationship between the Father and Son, you would apply what you understand about fathers and sons here in this world. Uh, That um, they, you know, my son is supposed to obey me right now. He's supposed to be sleeping in the other room. I don't know if he's doing it. I hope he's doing it. Uh, but he's supposed to be obeying me because I'm his father and he's the son. And so uh, there are a few things that we see in the word of God that kind of point to this. Uh, this view draws upon Jesus's many examples of subjecting himself to the father's will uh, while he lived upon the earth. Uh, so we see that uh, Jesus says that the father sent me and I've come to do his will. Uh, Philippians chapter two, the kenosis passage where we see Uh, this beautiful uh, description of what Jesus went through on the cross. Well, it says that he uh, obeyed, obeyed even to the point of death, even death on the cross. So uh, he obeyed the father. And so it takes those examples and says, "Okay, well, if Jesus is part of the Trinity, 
he doesn't change, then um, he's just always going to obey the Father. And that there's this this level, um, that's probably not the best way to put it, but there's this this leveling between them where the Father is above the Son and saying that the Father is the one who um, has this will that needs to be obeyed by at least the second person of the Trinity, the Son. So, uh, if you're, you're hearing that, um, you're, you're hearing that I have some issues with it, uh, because it's, it's not correct. But many issues devolve from this view, including that this lessens God the Son to a lower position than the Father. If the Father is the one who is always saying, this is the plan, Son, and the Son has to continually obey, that there is not just a level of uh, deference, which is how I would put it, um, but there's a level of uh, subjection, uh, subordination of the Son, that he is supposed to always subject himself to the Father. Uh, so there is not an equal standing in this view between the Father and the Son. Now, if you're wondering, like, who's talking about these things? Uh, a lot of people are. Um, there, there are times uh, where Wayne Grudem is one person who has talked about this a lot. Uh, even John Piper is one who's kind of hinted at it. Bruce Ware. Uh, there, are, there are many guys like that, and it's becoming a more prevalent view uh, even amongst preachers, so that, that lower tier of how things move, how theology kind of uh, morphs and shifts, at least uh, you know how people are viewing their theology. So uh, it's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, so, uh, also, the Son chose, while living on the earth, to submit himself to or obey the Father's will, while maintaining equal status with the Father. So, this is how I would put it, that there's a level of deference, uh, but it's, it's, it's a willful thing. It's not based on status. It's not based on position. Uh, and it is based on an action that the Son has chosen to obey the Father on earth. We see that very clearly. But after that, we have this equivalence very clearly. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 would be one uh, where he will reign. Um, and, and we see in John 3, uh, John 3 very clearly that the Father has given all things to the Son because he loves him. Uh, we see the Son being elevated to this equal standing with the Father all throughout except when he is on earth. Uh, so while he is on earth in this human form, as he is truly man and truly God, he is going to be uh, subjecting himself to the Father's will. Okay, I know. Maybe not, maybe not the easiest thing to get here. Uh, but I will ask it this way. Because uh, to also say uh, that... Um, you believe in the eternal subordination of the Son, you're also saying that there are different wills, that there is the will of the Father who says, this is the way I want it, and that there is the will of s the Son who chooses to then obey, uh, but not even chooses. That's not even the right term for this. this th it would be more like that he has to obey that will. So he has to get his will in alignment with the Father's will. Uh, that is a not. That is not a proper understanding of the Trinity. The Trinity is one God. Yes, there, there are different persons, and they have different functions, and they do different things, but that you're adding too much when you're starting to say that, well, there are separate wills, and that this, this person of the, the uh, Trinity, that he has a will that could be in contrast with another person of the Trinity's will. Uh, I know kind of getting into the weeds here, but what I mean by that is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is one God, and they have one will that will always be accomplished. And when you start breaking that up, you're kind of pitting different persons of the deity uh, uh, against each other. Uh, and we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. So uh, the way I would put it is that the Son uh, will always be an eternal sonship. And that that does not equate eternal submission or subordination. So he will always be the son of God the Father. Um, but that does not mean that he will always be uh, subordinate or lesser than the Father. All right. So just quickly, our Lord, 
Uh, Jesus Christ is Lord is the most simple confession that we have. That's so true. We see it all throughout the word of God. Uh, Romans 10 verse 9, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but uh, if you're like, we've, we've got a lot of time here, you can pause and go to those scripture passages and read it aloud. Um, but I'm pretty sure you guys know them. Uh, so I'll just move on here. Uh, what is our only hope in life and death? This comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, but also uh, from the New City Catechism. They just kind of stole it from the Heidelberg and changed a few words. Um, but what is our only hope in life and death? The answer is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's, that's why we exist. Uh, we, we belong to God the Father. We belong to the Son. And so when we're saying that Jesus Christ is Lord, we're saying that he owns us, that we belong to him. Uh, it, it's that he rules over us, that he is our king. So to, uh, to declare Jesus as Lord means that you are actively submitting to him as your ruler. Uh, so while you might look at the Apostles' Creed and say, I don't see where there's all that much application. Here we see very clearly that there's application. Um, if you if you are saying that Jesus is your savior and you're a Christian, then built within that to truly understand Jesus, you need to understand that he is your Lord and you must submit yourself to him. Now, that does not mean that you will always be perfect, but that at least in knowledge, you affirm that Jesus is your Lord. Uh, again, Justin Holcomb. Uh, because Jesus is the universal Lord, all worldly power is limited and provisional. Because he is Lord, social distinctions are re uh, relativized and will ultimately be set aside completely. So that kind of gives you a good perspective of where your life is, that you belong to Jesus. All the other stuff, I it's not going to last. Uh, Jesus is going to be the one who rules over you, and that is going to be the defining characteristic of your life. So that's what it means. That's what it means to believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Uh, I hope that you guys have learned something. Uh, I hope that it's been helpful for you. Uh, I'm, I'll be back with you in just a couple minutes here, probably. I hope that it didn't go too long as I'm looking at the clock, uh, but I'm excited to be able to share the word with you in just a few minutes here. A and if you have any questions, just let me know. You can text me. I've got my phone on me, even though I'm deep in in uh, in the bunker here. We still get you know, some cell uh, reception, so it's all good.